cultural studies cultural studies forum lecture number 3 and today we have with us anup sharma uh, who is working as a global corporate trainer in the knowledge academy which is based in bracknell uk uh, and he has teaching experience of 7 years uh, and he has done his uh, research in 2019 from ashoka university and his research interests and curiosities are in queer studies affect theory diaspora studies and spirituality and mindfulness training uh, and he has made a lot of presentations in national and international platforms and his latest uh, research in queerness and the question of identity in south asian diaspora is presented in the university of vienna austria uh, his article on queer belongings in the novel of cobalt blue by sachin kundalkar will be published by rutledge in an edited volume in 2023 congratulations on that sir so uh, without taking much time uh, we'll move to uh, listen to anup sharma sir directly yes sir you can go ahead yeah thank you sir uh, okay thank you megha and thank you uh, uh, kalyani ma'am for giving me this wonderful platform to share my uh, research my learnings on affect and queerness and uh, it's, it's indeed a great opportunity to uh, be able to speak uh, to a wide audience and also hopefully receive feedback and questions uh, towards the end um this is uh, an experimental paper uh, i am not uh, reading uh, from a paper but i am going to uh, present through my slides and i'm going to also interact with you all uh, just as we sort of try to get a sense of what uh, we are trying to grasp today uh, which is affect uh, theory and uh, what exactly is affect uh, to begin with and uh, i will try to okay okay great <laughs> okay i'll try to be a little louder um, and uh, how does really affect associate with queerness how does it associate with questions of desire questions of identity and uh, what is affect in the first place right and why are we talking about affect now um isn't it that affect is always already present in our life in the way we uh, sort of interact with people the way we live what is affect affect uh, some of us may think uh, it's emotions right uh but how things influence us uh, what kind of sensations what kind of feelings emerge into us when things happen to us right so these are some of the very generic uh, ways in which we understand affect but affect uh, if is generic then why uh, did it come Uh, later i mean we are around uh, you know late, late 20th century when uh, sedgwick was writing uh, you know and uh, we have tomkins before that uh, and uh, masumi and bergson and so on so uh, so what is about affect really then uh, if it is uh, you know as generic as feelings and as literature students are just students of life right uh, we feel isn't it we feel and we make sense of the world we touch we smell we um, you know uh, we taste and uh, that's how we sort of collect experience and uh, you know act out in the world but affect uh, theory has something uh, else to do um, than just you know uh, understanding the world through senses um affect is not something very deterministic it is not something that we can sort of decide to feel right and our feelings as we can uh, you know understand in our real world as well is 
um, very unpredictable, right? Uh, it's very difficult to choose our feeling. Uh, it's difficult to intend what we want to feel, how we want to feel, right? It happens to us. So it sort of uh, works as an interruption into everyday events, right? We don't sometimes know what makes us sad or makes us happy. Uh, it happens to us and then we sort of start giving meaning to it, giving language to it, giving words and start talking about it. Um, but initially, you know, when things happen, uh, we are in that moment, we live in that moment. So affect is a little different from emotions, uh, which Masumi says is social. Emotions are what is considered as a, a collective, as an idea, as a concept, as something that we agree upon, right? And affect is something that does not have a fixed beginning and does not have a fixed end. It emerges in in-betweenness in um, interactions uh, that happen and then it leads uh, to something and then something and then something. It is flexible, it's fluid, um, and it's very, very sensory in nature that way. Uh, something that we cannot really determine. So in this particular presentation, um, I, as I told you, I'm not reading out a paper. I don't want to be uh, very, uh, you know, uh, what do I say, uh, intellectual that way. I, I want to make it uh, more fun and conversational, interactive. I believe that's the best way <laughs> to kind of learn, isn't it? So um, share my screen and we'll kind of show you what I have uh, to speak about today on affect. Um, so this is something, right? Uh, and I would like to ask you all, uh, you might even post on the chat if you don't want to speak. What do you see on the screen? What does it look like? Okay, I'm being greeted by loud silence, it seems. Um, I, I, I totally understand. It looks very difficult to put a word to this picture. Yes, I'm getting some responses now. Okay, Saurav says it's scattered food on the table. Yes, we can see a lot of that. And Ashi says someone has eaten, but not in a neat manner. Right, isn't it? Um, and Kirti says it's messed food. Rumika says leftover food. MB says distorted feast. That's interesting. Distorted feast. Wow. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot there, right? I mean, if you just look at the responses, we can see on what different levels are these responses working. It's not simply uh, something you can make complete sense of, isn't it? It's something that, uh, you know, is confusing. Uh, it's it's not something linear. It's not something that you can make a complete sense of, right? It's not coherent. It's not neat, um, as somebody said. And it's scattered, right? It's messed up. It's all over the place, isn't it? And um, and we are able to respond to this all over the place ness uh, using language, but also a language that begs for continuation but is unable to, right? Unable to complete its, uh, what do I say, a meaningful circuit. <laughs> so, um, so this is a still life painting. It's a still life painting uh, by Peter Clash, who was a Dutch painter. And it's not important to know all of these details, but what is important here and what is the slide um, meant for is, to get a sense of what we feel about this picture, right? It's uh, certainly food, but it's messed up, right? Somebody might have eaten it. 
um, and uh, you know it's just left there it's scattered and all of that so it looks like it's in the middle of something right it's uh, something happened in the middle of eating maybe and that's what you see here now um, let's look at this particular passage it's, it's, it's a small section that i took from the a book, Ordinary Affects by Kathleen Stewart. And this particular section is called Still Life. So I'll give you a minute or two to read this. And uh, then we'll kind of discuss as to what you can sense out of this. What do you feel? What, what, what does it give you? Okay, so um, I hope you guys have finished reading it. Uh, I hope I'm not too fast. Um, just to get your responses uh, about what do you think this passage is communicating to us? Um, um, what, what really is striking to you? Any particular line, any particular word, any of the feelings uh, bubbling inside you that you'd like to kind of share? You can... Uh, you know, maybe type in the chat box or just uh, speak. I am continuously connecting it with my position on the hospital bed. Still life painting I've become. <laughs> most, of these, right. most of these words resonate with my condition. Yes, yes. I mean, no, completely agree. And, and it's it, life becomes so much more alive when we are still, right? I mean, that's that's exactly uh, what Absolutely. I think. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're getting some responses here and Kirti writes, stillness is where life begins. Life as in motion, something happening, right? Uh, so wow, life I could make I could write a paper on my condition and your theory. <laughs> Certainly, ma'am. I was I mean, flying till now. Suddenly, I touched my life. Right. How amazing that would be. Um, yeah, and Kainat says it's paradoxical. Yes, it is paradoxical that uh, when we are still, we can feel, we can sense so many things happening around, right? And we cannot... Um, you know, determine as to what we want to feel or how we want to feel. And what happens is what happens in the flow of things. So there is a difficulty here in sort of knowing something, right? Um, and that is what affect theory sort of talks about. That is the fact that knowledge uh, 
can be theorized, the fact that knowledge can have a particular language, a construction, that is something affect theory tries to oppose. And uh, this opposition again comes against the very uh, construction of uh, psychoanalytical uh, theories and uh, linguistic theories like structuralism and even post-structuralism, you know, to an extent where um, nothing is fixed and everything uh, can be seen in so many different ways. So trying to also question these uh, very uh, rigid ideas, you know, that uh, come with a particular vocabulary, come with a particular language and uh, do not really allow for an embodied experience of life and living itself, right? Uh, do not allow you to basically live through the process of what's happening and also without really choosing, you know, because uh, thinking is a choice, right? Knowledge uh, is a choice, it's an intention to know. And, and, and affect theory uh, basically questions this tyranny of knowledge, this tyranny of language that presumes a knowledge of a particular kind. And, uh, and, and, and uh, still life here is, it's a static state, but then it's vibratory, it's moving and uh, it's quivering, it's unfolding. And uh, it's ordinary, but it reveals a lot in the unfolding of the ordinary. So if ordinary is a static experience that we are already aware of, right? Like, okay, it's time to have lunch, it's time to have dinner, it's time to go out and, you know, shop. So some things that we already know, they are ordinary things that we do every day. But what happens in the living of the ordinary is something we cannot determine, right? And whether it is, you know, claiming identities, like, okay, this is my house and these are my parents, you know, this is my life, this is what I want to do in my life. So all of these uh, projects that we have for ourselves, these are projects that we kind of imagine, we visualize, we plan to achieve, but what happens through our journeys in achieving those, or maybe in sort of uh, changing our choices to achieve other things than what we had initially planned to, that basically is, is kind of a waking up of the senses. You know, it's the waking up of our, uh, our abilities to understand the world in more than just linguistic terms. So basically allowing your senses to explore the indeterminate flow of life, right? So that's basically uh, affect, right? And uh, affect, affects can be destructive, it may be constructive, it may be um, absolutely unpredictable. Uh, so affects are potentials, affects are uh, the impossible, uh, and affects are also the possible. And affects are experiences that we do not have knowledge of, and affects happen in the process, right? Um, so, so that's that's basically what I wanted to communicate with these uh, with these two uh, uh, you know items here, the picture and the uh, 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 this particular excerpt from the book. And here are a few definitions. Now, as we are moving towards affect theory, it's an uh, institutional uh, you know finding kind of within the uh, cultural study space, literary space. So people are talking about it, working on it. So they've already given a idea, a form. But then again, you know, as we all know, reading, writing, it's always about experimenting uh, with what we know and finding newer ways to intervene. And uh, these definitions will uh, probably now, you know, give you a sense as to what we are talking about. And uh, Brian Masumi, uh, who's one of the affect theorists, uh, 
and he says affect is irreducibly bodily and autonomic so affect uh, is basically housed in the body it's the body which speaks it's the body which influences you to uh, explore it's the body that sends you messages signals and it's the body that really is the uh, origin to meaning rather than meaning being already out there in the world it's it's through the body that you know the world and it's not um, something that other theorists like feminism queer theory and so on have not explored but the fact that they have uh, so much uh, you know um, been invested in politics or political uh, you know framings of knowledge that uh, politics itself has become so deterministic, right? I mean, we know uh, what is queer rights, so we know what's uh, the rights for women and you know all other identities. We all know that because it's all codified within a particular rights register that comes with a certain kind of a vocabulary. But affect sort of disturbs that. By that, me, uh, by that, um, I do not mean that affect is not political. It is political, but it is uh, radically political in the sense that it's more embodied. It's um, not, uh, uh, you know, it's not fixed in terms of a particular time or space or an idea or a logic or a theory, but it's something that sort of uh, is works like a narrative. It sort of emerges from the self, from the body, from, from the person, uh, from the experience of, of what's happening, you know, right now. Um, so affect has its own way of writing history, right? You write your history on your own through your experience, through what your body uh, responds, you know, to the world, or how the world sort of coming uh, into being through you, right? And that's exactly what Sarah Ahmed uh, also says uh, by when she uses the word "hap," the happening, right? The happening of the world is what. Uh, is what you bring about. So there is a world that's happening that you are creating. Um, and then, of course, there is this received idea of the world that comes with all of its beliefs and norms and values and, uh, you know, identities and what we should do, what we shouldn't do, and so on and so forth, right? So the affective is not about empathy or emotive identification or any form of identification for that matter. So affect does not uh, ask you to identify uh, because there is an identity existing. So if we kind of think about our identities as, you know, uh, as whatever gender we, will, we identify with, these genders are genders that we've accepted, right? We are sort of chosen, like these are our expressions or they have been given to us because they really make us feel acceptable in the society we live in, isn't it? And uh, whether it is our nationality or whether it is, uh, you know, maybe our culture or, uh, you know, certain belief systems, uh, all of these are things we kind of hold on to very dearly because we fear that we'll be left out and others will have the party while we will be all lonely, isn't it? Uh, but affect, being affective, living affectively is basically uh, distancing yourself uh, from the tyranny of identity because when there is a particular identity to hold to, it also comes with a lot of limitations, isn't it? Uh, because you'll have to you know, follow these rules and regulations and try your best to be acceptable, right? Uh, in your group, uh, uh, you know, make your friends happy and all that. So affective knowledge, affective learning, affective uh, modes of inquiry uh, is not about identification, uh, but it is basically how we identify. It's not about identity, which is already there, but how we sort of uh, identify, which is basically our internal process of identification. 
Um, and the moreover, it's not emotive. So uh, when Masumi says emotive identification, he means social identification because for him, emotions are socially constructed. And uh, then we have another uh, theorist, Eric Schulz, who says it is important not to confuse affect with feelings and emotions. Affect is not a personal feeling. Feelings are personal and biographical. Emotions are social. And affects are pre-personal. And affect is a non-conscious experience of intensity, right? And the word intensity is very important in affect because intensity means that particular moment where something strikes you and something uh, that you don't know that will strike you, right? And it happens to you. So, um, so an affect is a non-conscious experience of intensity. Affects are uh, pre-personal. It's basically, uh, what uh, happens to you as, uh, in, as, as, uh, as a person who is, um, who, who precedes identity, who precedes the knowledge of who uh, he, she, or they are, right? And uh, um, because the person is also a social concept, isn't it? Uh, you are a person because you behave in a particular way and that is socially sanctioned and uh, you're a part of that social space and you gain acceptability. So, um, but affects are pre-conscious, they are pre-personal and it is a moment of unformed and unstructured potential. So affects are potential experiences, experiences that happen. They are not predetermined. Another important quote is affect cannot be fully realized in language, isn't it? And that's exactly what happened in the first example that people were using words like messy, uh, scattered, uh, you know, and the confusion, all of that. So affect uh, cannot be a fully realized in language. You cannot capture affect in language. It's not a theory that comes with a rigid, uh, you know, uh, framework. And uh, therefore, affect can be very, uh, as, a, as a theory, as, a, as if you would like to use the word tool, <laughs> although I don't like that, uh, to reading and understanding the world, it's, it's more fluid. It sort of associates with other ideas as well. And, and that's something we will uh, try to uh, explore further in the coming slides. So affect is the body's way of preparing itself for action in a given circumstance by adding a quantitative dimension of intensity to the quality of an experience, right? So affect is a way of uh, sort of preparing the body uh, to act uh, um, by increasing the quality of experience. Um, and as we know, affect basically is present in your body. The body uh, basically speaks through affect. Uh, so it's basically an embodied form of communication. It's an embodied form of language. Um, and it has a grammar of its own. And finally, by Ruth Lays, um, and you must all read the essay, The Ascent of Affect by Ruth Lays, which will give you a fitting introduction to affect theory. Affect is independent of signification and meaning, which means that there is no specific framework that we can sort of uh, put uh, affect theory into, um, which does not mean that you cannot make affect uh, uh, meaningful in your own way. It's basically a way to say that affect uh, really makes the reader um, independent uh, in terms of how they want to interpret. And, and that means that uh, it, it also gives a lot of space to uh, how you are really able to embody what you're reading, right? and uh, write as though you are uh, really living that experience as a, as a happening that basically happens. So, um, so affect 
so so a lot of auto ethnographic works or a lot of uh, you know uh, auto theoretical works uh, auto theory is sort of uh, again uh, being very popular uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, theoretical uh, device um use affect uh, you know as a method and of course queer theory and affect theory are um, often uh, you know um, you know together in terms of how we see both of them sort of feeding each other or you know kind of uh, operating together um, because uh, what is theory really what is theory theory is experience theory is something that you uh, put language to after you experience something otherwise if theory was all about language and using language to describe experience then it would have been very limiting because experience always challenges what's there in language that is what is theoretical right and and expands the uh, realm of theory uh, so people with diverse experiences uh, they contribute to the existing repository of theory and make it more and more diverse, isn't it? So affect theory sort of offers you that possibility to, uh, to make your experience uh, speak uh, on its own. Uh, okay, so a lot about that already here. Uh, uh, let's try to read now something interesting. And uh, I want to show you a trailer of this film, Fire by Deepa Mehta. And this film raised a lot of controversy. Uh, I'm sure some of you already are aware of this movie. This was released in the year 1996. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was, it, it, it was released globally. Uh, so you have, uh, you know, uh, voices from the diaspora talking about the film and voices from within the nation as well. And uh, yes, um, and uh, what was this film all about? <laughs> so let's like uh, look at that uh, from the trailer and try to understand what is this film all about? Okay, so let me share this. I hope the video would be good. I'm not sure though. Uh, I have fairly, I, I hope I can trust my internet. <laughs> uh, give me a minute. Uh, can all of you see the screen? Uh, if you can, you just uh, maybe type in the chat box or just. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We okay. can see it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Um, okay. Okay. Can you hear the sound? Can you hear the sound? Can you play no, it sir? again, sir? No, sir. No, you no, can't sir. hear. Okay, just. Uh... Okay, uh, I'll just fix this. Uh, give me a moment. Okay, I'll just play it now and just let me know if you can hear the sound. 
Can you hear the sound? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, great, great. Okay, so here it goes. Not only famous for the Taj Mahal, it's also very famous for the lunatic asylum. Maybe that's where you end up. Are you going to be home tonight? Maybe. You must give a chance to Sita. Your duty as husband demands that you do. I need you. Not tonight. Yeah, yeah. Once you're married, you're stuck forever, like you. Jatin asleep? No, he's gone to meet his girlfriend. I'm lucky to have such a good family. Swamiji says the only reason to have a sexual relationship is to have sons that will carry on the family name. Did we do anything wrong? What I saw in the bedroom is a sin in the eyes of God and man. <laughs> There's no word in our language that can describe what we are, how we feel for each other. Is that Sita's fault? All these new ideas in your head? I think you're a pompous fool. I desire Sita. I desire her warmth, her compassion. I desire to live again. Okay, so uh, we will just watch that uh, trailer. I'm sorry, I'll just uh, uh, um, close this YouTube, otherwise it'll start playing lots of things uh, that I would not be, okay. Yes, um, yes. Uh, so we just watched that particular trailer, right? And by watching that trailer, of course, some of you have heard about the film before, maybe some of you have also watched it. Um, maybe just, uh, you know, type on the chat box, uh, what are the, uh, you know, uh, initial uh, feelings or responses that you get? Maybe, you know, just a word or a phrase? Uh, what do you think about the film by watching the trailer? Okay, so, okay, identity crisis, uh, says MB, and Ashley says feelings of, feelings versus society, that's, that's great. And Angeline says uh, recognition of feelings, wonderful. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, these are great responses here. And if you just notice, there was certain interesting tropes that we are getting, right? The trailer was trying to frame the film in a particular way, right? It was trying to, uh, and uh, Pratima says, identity of a woman, great. This trailer was trying to frame the film in a particular way, maybe advertise it in a particular way, project it in a particular way, right? And, uh, and, and did you notice those, uh, uh, reviews, those very pithy and, uh, you know, uh, two or three worded reviews that came, uh, you know, towards the end. Uh, some of them said revolutionaries, one of them said erotic heat, right? And, and, and prior to that, what do we see? You know, there was this, uh, uh, you know, these uh, 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 phrases popping up, yes, taboo, right? Um, they, they were advertising it as a taboo relationship. It is an ordinary family, 
uh, two wives, uh, you know, middle class family kind of, uh, you know, uh, setting there. And wow, I'm getting a lot of responses now. <laughs> um, uh, and sort of says giving importance to one's own feelings and desire and break the old conventions. Great. Uh, maybe Philip female centric says Jennifer, our identity crisis, suppressed feelings. Great. So, and Keith, this is diverse aspects of fire, especially in terms of rift associated with gender and society. Uh, all these are wonderful responses. And, and all these responses, when you see, they are sort of, uh, you know, uh, slotted into some identity types, right? When you say female, when you say, uh, you know, I, identity crisis and uh, and similarly the trailer as well was trying to project that right that these are two women uh, in caught in a traditional uh, middle class household um, you know it's an ordinary family um, and there is something that's beneath the surface so beneath the ordinariness there is something that's bubbling right and um, this is uh, what uh, you know, uh, one of the characters says, uh, I'm lucky to have uh, a family like this, right? And at the same time, we see the uh, very erotic, uh, you know, a friendship between the two women uh, who are uh, related to each other as daughters-in-law, right? Radha and Sita, kind of funny uh, with the name of the characters uh, that we kind of... Uh, uh, that we also see in Ramayana, uh, uh, in our uh, scriptures. So, um, so a taboo breaking film, a bold film, a revolutionary film. Yes, a film that's breaking stereotypes. So these are the uh, kind of ideas that we get, right? These are the kind of words that sort of categorize this film in a particular way, right? So uh, this is also a queer moment, right? Uh, it's a moment where, uh, of course, section 377 was still uh, there. And as you all know, section 377 uh, criminalized uh, um, homosexual acts. And uh, this film was kind of, uh, you know, the, the way, uh, you know, uh, India could see itself as a modern nation. Uh, that uh, accepts diverse forms of sexualities. And uh, no wonder why there was so much of opposition, you know, from the right wingers and uh, people who said, oh, this is, you know, destabilizing the Indian traditional family. And, and, and this film was also contextualized uh, in an Indian traditional family uh, and, 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 and a relationship in the family, within the household, right? Between uh, two women who are related uh, with each other uh, as um, members of the family, not, you know, uh, neighbors or, you know, friends. And um, so this film is certainly attacking something very hardcore and traditional and uh, very identitarian when we think about ideas like nation, ideas like, uh, you know, gender, because how should a woman uh, be in this particular uh, nation, uh, you know, within the family, which is a very classical heteronormative family from the outside. So, so that's how the film sort of shows itself. But as we will see, uh, the film, uh, while it shows that, uh, it also is trying to destabilize those very categories that it sort of promotes itself by, and then how. Um, so, um, so these are some of the Rick's responses. So once this film was released, uh, social commentators uh, from India and the West had particular ways of responding to this film. And you can also see those pictures, right? In, uh, you know, in one of the pictures you'll see uh, uh, towards my left, uh, it says bold, sumptuous and taboo breaking uh, and sort of heralding the liberal modern India, which accepts diverse forms of sexualities and, 
Here you have, uh, you know, a women's wing of a particular organization which um, is concerned about the collapse of, uh, you know, the heteronormative family and, uh, you know, the very idea of reproduction, uh, you know, which basically the so-called helps continue a family. Um, and then look at what uh, the international responses are. Uh, so what Madhukishwar says is, I wanted to ignore the film as an exercise in self-flagellation by a self-hating Hindu and a self-despising Indian, a very common type among the English educated elite in India. So this film is not a film that is made by somebody who lives in India, right? This is made by Deepa Mehta who lives in the US or uh, in, the, in North America. And, uh, and she's basically making this film um, and has her own way of visualizing the Indian, uh, you know, traditional Hindu middle-class family in Delhi. And uh, she is uh, here, you know, um, critiqued, uh, you know, by saying that, okay, these are the English educated elites of India who don't live in India. They don't know uh, what's India like and how the relationships work in India in a traditional uh, Hindu family, uh, which probably they presume is all of India. And, and, and below this, you see this global response that, look, India is a place where lesbianism is still frowned upon, that people, uh, you know, cannot understand uh, these relationships because it's completely outside their experience and there is no language, there's no word for it. So in a way, trying to be the colonial, uh, you know, uh, 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 knowledge giving, uh, <laughs> you know, institution. Uh, so they are the ones to give us identities and knowledge about identities so that we can adapt, accept and adopt and adapt it into our everyday lived realities, right? So that's the colonial uh, knowledge making infrastructure that Robert, Roger Ebert, uh, Ebert's review uh, sheds light on. And, uh, and then both of these responses, as you can see, they are very, very uh, rooted in a particular idea of India. So um, one is basically, you know, uh, the English educated elite, but doesn't understand uh, forward Indian uh, values, uh, because India is very forward, it's ahead of the world and all that. And then here it is another, uh, you know, you know, coming from the West that India is still very, uh, you know, backward in terms of uh, giving space to diverse sexualities and uh, respecting and accepting these identities and uh, that we don't even know what these are first, uh, basically, because they don't exist in our language. So, so both of these are ideological impulses to kind of slot of or fix a film, right? Um, in a particular bracket. And the film also, as you saw in the trailer, tries to kind of um, work on these tropes. It tries to be a taboo breaking film. It tries, tries to question the traditional heteronormative Hindu family uh, and it's, uh, you know, structure and modes of relations. Um, and uh, it wants to appear as this progressive film. But there is still something that maybe uh, we can think about. And I want to show you two uh, clips now, and uh, I will take your responses in terms of how do you, uh, how, how do you, uh, how do these clips affect you? How do these clips make you uh, experience the film? Okay.
uh, are you able to listen to the uh, sound? Please let me know. Is yes, sir. A, yeah, okay, great. एक बहुत पुरानी कहानी है एक बस्ती थी एक ऊंचे पहाड़ पर वहां के लोगों ने कभी सागर नहीं देखा था हाँ सुना जरूर था इसीलिए वो लोग उदास रहते थे मगर गांव की एक बुढ़िया ने उनसे कहा मत हो उदास जो दिख नहीं सकता वो भी है दिखता बस बिना आंखें खोले मन की आंखों से देखो राधा समझी नहीं <laughs> okay so i'll uh, show you another clip now And uh, before uh, showing this clip, I just want to give a brief context. So this is basically a uh, picnic uh, scene. It's a scene where Radha, Sita and their husbands are uh, in a picnic. And there is a moment here that I want you all to focus on. Just give them two. क्या मौसम हो रहा है आ, नहीं मैं लेटता हूँ जरा कुछ ज्यादा ही खा लिया सारी सुबह काम किया है आपने लाइए मैं पैर दबा दू नहीं रहने तो हाँ भाई अपनी मेहनती भाभी को अच्छी सी मसाज दो आशीर्वाद मिलेगा ये मेरा सौभाग्य है कि ऐसा परिवार है हमारा देखो देखो कैसी हस पड़ी यहां Okay, so um, so you watch these two clips, right? Uh, in in one of the clips, uh, um, Radha's parents are basically in that uh, particular field, and uh, you know the sunflower field, and 
there is a conversation happening there, right? Uh, so what um, basically strikes out from there is what you can't see, you can see, uh, but you have to see it differently, right? And then this particular, uh, you know, video where uh, we basically saw this scene where, um, you know, Radha and Sita are having a particular moment, which again is difficult to kind of give name to, you know, put a language to, uh, but it's happening, right? So what do you make out of these two uh, scenes? Okay, in the second scene, uh, Saurav says words are omitted, no statement, but the desires are expressed through gestures, body, yes, yes. What else? Yeah. So, so you know, in both of these, uh, yes, Neha, you have a question. Okay. Um, so, in both of these scenes, there is something very interesting happening with, uh, you know, language and identity, right? Um, it is a tradition. In the second scene, it's a traditional uh, family setting. It's a picnic setting, and the, you know, uh, Radha Sita and the husbands are there. And Ashok, the husband of Sita, he's, he is very happy with his family. He looks around and he's, his grandmother is, his mother is sleeping. And, um, you know, it's a happy picnic uh, in experience there. Uh, but what happens in that particular, you know, moment where uh, Radha sort of uh, starts massaging Sita's feet, that is, uh, some that's that becomes an affective moment. It's it becomes a moment that interrupts that scene, right? It interrupts the very logic of heteronormativity, the very logic of heterosexual desire, uh, based on which uh, Radha, uh, her husband Sita, her husband, you know, they're together as one family unit in that particular spot, right? And uh, in that particular experience, in that particular shot, uh, we can see the, you know, the gaze, uh, Radha's gaze over Sita, and the way she, you know, holds the feet, the way she massages. That is that effective language, as we can see, which, which sort of disrupts this whole idea of the family, uh, the idea that you know the family is right there as the stable, uh, static, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, experience of people uh, being together and you know, having a nice time, that particular uh, experience gets destabilized through the logic of desire. So affect uh, by way of desire. Um, and, and here we don't really see, okay, who, again, for somebody who is just watching the scene, it's not very clear uh, whether they are really sexually identifying uh, as lesbians or you know they have a particular sexual orientation it's it's something that even defies the logic of desire um, that is hinged on sexual attraction right and uh, it, it sort of opens up uh, the, the scene to uh, a more uh, discursive and affective plane where uh, two women are desiring each other in a, you know, very ordinary, you know, experience of a family picnic, right? So that becomes very discursive and very, um, you know, disruptive of this logic of the traditional heterosexual family. And, as, and, 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 and when we like look at the whole idea of a taboo breaking film, revolutionary film, these become very, uh, you know, uh, very, very, very nice words to maybe show how uh, forward the film is. But at the same time, what we see is there are these scenes that kind of 
make uh, you know those uh, the logic of what's taboo what's revolutionary more subtle right uh, because this kind of uh, uh, desire that cuts across heteronormative ideas of uh, what uh, you know traditional woman in a family should do all those ideas get you know destabilized but not in a very uh, very outspoken manner uh, but in uh, in an everyday uh, effective uh, ways, right? Um, of, uh, you know, looking at, um, you know, each other with a sense of, uh, uh, of liking, of desiring. And in the first scene, what you saw is basically the inability to uh, see uh, and the inability to see because there is no proper language. Isn't it? And, and this particular uh, paradox of not being able to see and not having a language uh, is then, uh, you know, answered um, as a way to basically look inwards, right? Uh, you look at, uh, look at, look at uh, it from your mind's eye, the monkey arc. Um, and that's how you'll be able to see and know and understand, isn't it? So, so there are of these uh, nuances and uh, layers, as Nikita says, where desire does not give you a fixed name, a fixed identity, a fixed uh, knowledge of who should desire whom and in what way. But desire plays out in these uh, affective terrains, you know, in these ordinary moments, uh, like in the family, and um, the, and and this difficulty to know what's happening. But but when things happen and and they play out and they sort of open up uh, newer possibilities and potential to uh, you know identify right uh, who one is and who one desires. So, so that's what I wanted to uh, kind of express. And so these are the two, uh, you know, uh, sentences that I've taken from the film. What you can't see, you can see. You just have to see without looking, right? You have to see from your mind's eye without looking. So there's something else there uh, that you uh, have to grasp, to know, to understand, and that is, uh, something that you do uh, by really being in that process, being in the space of knowing instead of presuming uh, the knowledge, uh, presuming the idea um, and thinking that you already know. Um, and, and that impossibility as well, right, to know um, is, is what is expressed again uh, in that particular scene, the second scene, wherein we are not sure what kind of a relationship these two people share. If you just, you know, watch that clip. Uh, but it is a moment where we are able to see two women relating with each other in a manner that uh, does not really obey the traditional hierarchical regulations of, you know, how... Um, women should behave maybe in a family um, because while for uh, you know Ashok who is Sita's husband uh, it is just a moment between two uh, you know women in the family who are loving and caring each other but the subtext is something else right the subtext is that they are women who desire each other and you can look at those gazes you can look at the movements of the eye you can look at the tone of that expression, the slight, uh, you could say, puffiness or you know, certain brightness, the eyes, and and these are ways in which you are able to relate to each other through the act of touch, right? Through the act of touch, you are able to know who is uh, what and how we are relating with the other person. And uh, this is where I want to end with this particular quote. So what we see. Uh, as coming out in this, um, in these two examples, is desire as affect, right? So, what is desire? Desire is that which, in every instance, hollows out ontology. Whether it is libidinal desire for someone who falls outside the bounds of what we consider our sexuality, or a longing that stretches beyond the borders of our politics, 
Desire does not respect limits. It is restless and non-unifying. It keeps moving, which is why it dis disables ontological fixes. And it is indifferent, which is why it is politically incorrect. Desire is surprising because it can erupt at the most unexpected moments and in the most inconvenient circumstances. Perhaps most important, desire cannot suture bodies onto identities. It fails to arrest its metonymic slide with the fiction of a unified self. So there's a lot here, but I just uh, conclude by saying that desire is something that disturbs this idea of a fixed identity. Desire is indifferent to this logic of identity in terms of who should identify as what. And uh, the affect of desire sort of spills out from the body. It sort of uh, spills out from the idea as to who one is relating to and how. It sort of creates relationships and creates these circumstances of relating with people. And uh, it disturbs these ideas of, uh, you know, what is uh, normal, what is not normal, what is expected, what is not expected, you know, what is social, what is not social. The desire uh, happens, emerges in the moment, and it makes things happen. So that's that from my side. I'm sure I've taken a lot of time, uh, maybe beyond <laughs> my assigned time, but uh, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you. In case you have any questions, you can ask me. That was a wonderful lecture, sir. Uh, now it is open for discussion. Any questions are welcome. You can either uh, unmute yourself and talk, ask, uh, or you can type it in the chat box. So, uh, can you share your uh, mail ID, sir, so that in case yeah. any doing research on uh, the areas that yes, certainly can contact you, sir. Yes, I hope I was uh, easy to follow. <laughs> yes. Given the response, I I was really scared whether uh, you guys have understood what I said or did it all go above your head or something. Yeah, Nikita, yes, certainly. Virginia Wolf Stream of Consciousness and Joyce and Edison, Moments of Extraordinary, Ordinary Fleeting Life. Yes, 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 absolutely. I have watched this movie, Sir Fire. Okay. Um, more than lesbianism, what, uh, uh, what I feel is it is more of a woman's choice to come out of the restricted environment in which. Sita and Radha stay in uh, making choices, ma taking a different track, which is not considered to be uh, a normal by the society. Yes. 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 And it's certainly a choice uh, between the two, uh, but that is something we already know, right, through the film. But what's more important and interesting for me is how do those choices come about? You know, is it like, okay, I uh, desire you and is that the end of it? Or is it more like an exploration within the confines of the traditional heterosexual family? Because it is basically coming to uh, terms with your own sexuality as well as uh, learning about your desire for the other and accepting the other. And yes. that is a process. It's There is no dictionary um, or no book that will tell you how to do it. And, yes. Uh, you basically uh, learn by looking, observing, listening, and being, uh, you know, there. And uh, 
and and again it, this is very political because as you could see in that particular scene as well that mm. on one hand uh, you had a shock and uh, you know his brother and you know that very conventional uh, scene where they are all sitting together happy um, you know yes. and in that moment of happiness and that very stable peaceful um, you know time there is this disruption there is this uh, uh, you know uh, this desire to identify as you know uh, you know uh, identify with sita uh, you know uh, with radha so that thing happens and, uh, and these are the subtle uh, ways in which affect operates when you don't really know uh, exactly when how in what way but it happens and yes. and, and that's how you know we disrupt these traditional institutional infrastructures um Yes, Kainat. I think I will email uh, you all. Uh, I have Megha's email ID, and I will share all the essays uh, with her, and uh, she can sort of forward it to you. The group cultural studies forum group. I'll definitely do that. Yes. Sir. Okay. Uh, we have a question here. When uh, by Ayushi. when do you think the idea can change about certain area or place or rather what can really change the perception so again you know uh, affect theory is not interested about what i usually affect a theory is interested about how you know uh, it's about how does the change happen so what are the factors what are the uh, you know flows or what are the uh, influences and motivations that basically change a person's feeling or rather a person's uh, way of responding to a situation and, uh, and 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 you really cannot pre decide right you cannot determine and uh, affect up happens operates as an in between um you know uh, event of flow and uh, that's basically affect affect is non essential in nature it it does not uh, presume a fixed or unified idea you know um and therefore it's very placeless or you could say uh it sort of uh, inhabits in places it's like water you put you water in you know whatever container it takes the shape of that similarly affect it houses in your body and it sort of emerges from that so affects are intensities their emergences uh their happenings okay jennifer says Uh, so could you please opine yourself that in india we are not yet advanced to break our family relationships over the hidden desires as those of radha uh, yes jennifer um, and i don't think it's all it's only about india it's also about so many different countries where uh, sexuality is still you know considered to be a very very uh, uh what do i say uh, difficult to uh, talk about in the family or uh, you know even to choose that okay i want to be this uh, particular person in terms of okay i you know identify as this person and i have this desire um so it's difficult to basically uh, stand tall in terms of what you want to uh, you know feel as you know and that's because of the way our society is conditioned uh, by you know no, these uh, norms and values and beliefs and and these sort of uh, and we have also accepted these right uh, because jennifer if you do not question them they are not going to change so you also have an agency uh because you are attending these sessions and you are reading about affect theory and you are you know about gender and sexuality uh, studies and queer rights and what is sexual liberation and all of that and you are making yourself aware so so that's something you are doing now 
because you have the tools, you can question the existing system and make these you know, tiny adjustments around your life so that you can live free and choose what you want to do in life. So the, quest, the answer to your question is yes, India largely is still very conservative, but then who creates that? We create that, right? And we accept it and we perpetuate it. And uh, the way to uh, sort of disrupt and disturb these is by starting to question, starting to own your voice, make your choices and be accountable and responsible in terms of who you want to be and how you want to be, who you want to be. And even uh, in the film, it was not easy, right? For Sita and Radha, they were ostracized from the family. Uh, they were also called names and they were excluded and they've, you know, so it was not easy. But uh, it's not easy anywhere that way, you know. It's difficult to make a choice in terms of what you want in life, who you love and uh, uh, who you desire and so on. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Uh, any more questions? Uh, kindly check the chat box. Sir has uh, mailed you his email ID. Uh, sir has messaged his email ID. So in case of any queries, uh, you can always mail him. Uh, and whatever sir sh uh, will share to my mail, I'll be sharing it in the cultural uh, forum uh, group that we have. Yes, sir. I'll do that, sir. Okay, great. Um, and, and my intention was not to make it very academic, not to make it very, uh, you know, serious in that very strictly institutional sense. Uh, my aim was to make it interactive and engaging, and uh, I don't know how much it has worked, but uh, I, I I did give it a try. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting me and giving me this platform. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed today's session. Thank you. Yes, sir. Same here, sir. I thank you for a wonderful session. Uh, I thank everyone who have attended this. There are a lot of people who are watching in YouTube, sir. So in case uh, any questions are there, I'll uh, do forward it to you and you can give a reply to that too, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.